Okay. I have to tell you, Vivian, when I do podcast episodes about money, I am probably the most intimidated that I ever am. And I cover some complex issues like about gender and race. Money makes me so nervous to talk about. I feel really uneducated. So I'm very excited to learn with you because I feel like you break it down in a, in a digestible way. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And I hate that money makes you feel uncomfortable because <laughs> you shouldn't like we all need money. We all use money. We all spend money. We all save hopefully money. Yeah. It, it's just so strange to me that like, that's the one topic in society that's like so touchy. You know, my dad said to me the other day, if you read as many books about finance as you did about self-help, you'd be really rich. <laughs> like, I think maybe I need to pick up a book or two, but now I have you. So I'm excited to jump in. Um, I want to know what an early experience with money is that really shaped you. Oh, okay. I'll give you the most traumatic one. Okay. I went to the mall with a girlfriend and this was when I was like late middle school, early high school and ripped jeans were just really becoming like super duper popular. And I bought a pair of ripped jeans from, I want to say it was like Abercrombie and Fitch or something. And I came home with these ripped jeans and my mom found out how much I had spent on them. And you, she, like, you would have thought I told her I had gotten a tattoo, which I, you now know that I have, but she literally started world war three with me. She was like, you're so, you know, irresponsible. You don't know the value of a dollar. And Mm -hmm. the only thing that I could think to say to her was like, well, you know, my XYZ friend who I went to the mall with, she got the same pair. We have, we have matching pairs. And she said to me, she was like, well, her dad's a lawyer and your parents aren't, and we're not millionaires and you can't be spending money like that. And I had a, like a moment of frustration as like a young person who obviously was like, you know, 14. Mm-hmm. So a lot of teenage angst, but also this feeling of almost like helplessness of like, why don't we have more money? And I kind of made a decision that like, you know, for me, I want to grow up and I want to be rich. I want to be rich. I want to buy all the ripped jeans that I want. I don't want anyone to tell me no. I don't want to be able to feel like I have to go without, even if it's something as silly as a pair of jeans. And it really frustrated me that money was such a big concern for my parents. And obviously, you know, I think I was a little naive. My parents are immigrants. They came over to the U S in their early twenties. Like they really had to fight tooth and nail for their place in the world. And they've certainly landed what I would consider the American dream coming over with very little resources. Now owning their home, owning their car, being able to go on vacation. My dad's retired. My mom's going to be retired in a couple of years. And like, they really do have a wonderful life and they certainly have a lot more money now and they're more financially comfortable, but it was a, it was a tough moment, I would say, for like young Vivian to like feel like our family has less money than other families. Those things really stay with you when you're younger. Um, that feeling of we have less or we are without. Um, does it ever really leave you, do you think? I am very much of the camp that like the financial traumas your parents had that they pass on to you really do stay with you for your lifetime. When I started working on Wall Street, I would say I was, I was always very frugal when I moved from wall street to tech and I was making five times as much money. I was still really frugal. I was wearing pants until they were like falling apart at the seams. And even now I feel very fortunate that, you know, I have a very awesome business. Mm -hmm. I launched my own podcast recently. That's doing very well. I am coming out with my own book at the end of the year. I'm poised to make seven figures and I still shop at Marshall's because I want to wear nice clothing for less. I still clip coupons. I still use cashback apps. And for me, I feel like that sense of like the other shoes always going to drop. There's going to be some sort of financial emergency that you're gonna have to take care of around the corner that my parents always felt that stayed with me, even though I'm certainly not in the same financial position that they were in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that um, no matter how much work you do around money, what it means to you, all of the philosophical questions that you can ask yourself about money, um, your upbringing has so much to do with how you feel about it. You know, you mentioned Wall Street. So did the idea of being wealthy to you uh, correlate with working on Wall Street? That was your first job. Oh, 100%. Like, (laughs) 
people who go on Wall Street say that they do so because they have a passion, mm -hmm. a passion for getting paid. And honestly, if anyone tells you otherwise, that they're like, oh, I'm like really interested in like the market, like shut up. No, you're not. You're interested in cutting a check. Like it is a job. And I ended up in that job because I am a follower. Um, all of the kids, I went to, I went to U Chicago and it's a very well-known school for economics. It's a very well-known school. For Barack Obama went there. Exactly. Like just, you know, it, it's a school that is known to feed into these wall street banks. Yes. And all of my peers, all of my friends were recruiting for wall street jobs. And I was like, Oh, well, like I'll do that too. Cause like, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Like all your friends are doing it. And I ended up with that job. And when I got there, I was like, I'm going to make so much money, especially with, <laughs> especially with like movies of like Wolf of Wall Street. I'm like, oh yeah, I want to pound my chest. I want to make bajillions of dollars. Like I want to, you know, drive a fancy car. I want to go to fancy dinners. And I will say like, that's probably like a very shallow and silly reason of how I picked my first job. Would you say that those uh, stereotypes from movies are true? To an extent. Um, I think... Wall Street is very much portrayed like how it was back in the 80s where like there was these unlimited expense accounts, like people are just ballers, like crazy, which was true back in the day in the 80s. These days, I would say it's quite a bit more reined in, but mm -hmm. it wasn't out of the norm for me as like a first year analyst, very young person on the desk to be taken to, you know, sweet tickets to see the red hot chili peppers or a dinner where the bill came out to be hundreds of dollars per person, you know, per head. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you, you know, you get, you buy into this glitz and glamor. You're like, there's no way at 22 on my current salary, I would be able to go to this restaurant and order steak and caviar and all of these things. But like, you can do that in that job because there's somebody else paying for it. You have a great bio. First of all, I, I'm obsessed with bios. <laughs> um, I don't know if any, if you ever do this, but on, um, all the big agencies like WME and CAA, mm -hmm. they have all their clients bios online and I go through them religiously, like picking out parts that I love. You have a fantastic bio, <laughs> uh, the way you love money. I love writing. So, um, I loved hearing about the moment of reckoning that you had when you quit Wall Street because it felt unexpected to me. Can you share with everybody the moment that you decided you'd had enough? Yeah, so when I started my job on Wall Street, I was very lucky. Um, I looked around, everybody was a white guy except for my manager. Um, this woman became my mentor, You know, one of the closest people I had having moved to New York, not knowing anybody. I actually put her down as my emergency contact for like the first two years of my life in New York. Cause I didn't know anybody so else. Like all, what, like, what is my other like idiot 22 year old roommate going to do? Like nothing. Like, <laughs> so she taught me everything I knew for the first year and a half. I had a great experience. I was learning oh, a ton. Man. And then the head of my desk got let go. And these kinds of things happen. These shifts happen on the street all the time. But when he got fired, a new big boss got brought in and he ended up firing a bunch of people, brought on, brought on his own guys. So the team started to look really different than the one that had hired me. And I went from being this like superstar junior talent who everybody liked to the girl who just like couldn't do anything right. The head of the desk found out that mm -hmm. I actually knew my way around an Excel sheet pretty well. Um, most trading analysts don't because they don't need that skill. But I had spent the summer prior to that in more of a banking role. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was doing in an Excel sheet. And he was like, hey, like, do you want to leave your manager and come work for basically like my BFF, my, you know, guy that I'm hiring, my right hand man. And when the head of the desk asks you a question like that and you're 22, 23, you don't say no. Mm -hmm. because you know it's going to really just like kill your career. Um, so I went to go work for his best friend and this guy just like sucked. And like, there's no other way to put that. He was so horrible, a terrible mentor, wasn't interested in really teaching, certainly didn't treat me with respect. Um, but you know, like uh, I had very much bought into this like Wall Street mentality of like, it's tough. You just kind of have to have a tough skin, whatever. So I stuck with it. I stuck with it. I worked there for about another, you know, year. Um, and then one day I came into work with a long cardigan on and this guy looked at me, he laughed and he put his hands together and he bowed and he goes, Ooh, is that a kimono? And to hear that from someone who was my manager, 
someone who was supposedly the one who was going to be teaching me, who's going to be in the back room, pounding the table, making sure I got paid as junior talent. Having him say that to me from a position of power, me being one of the only women on the desk, one of two, and one only one of two people of color on the desk, it didn't feel right. I was fed up. I was like, I'm not I don't need this job. Like I'm too smart to be spoken to this way. Like I have so many skills. I have so many talents and I don't even know where that like blind delusion came from. Sounds like it wasn't delusion. You know, I I'd like to think that like, I knew that I had skills that were going to be transferable. So I was like, I'm literally about to quit my job. So I pulled my initial manager, my mentor aside. And I was like, girly, like I'm, I'm about to quit. Nothing lined up. I hate it here. I literally don't want to work here anymore. And she was like, okay, just like pump the brakes. Mm -hmm you are also smart enough to recognize that that's not going to look good on your resume. Like just tough it out for the next few weeks, few months. We'll try and help you figure something out. And I was very fortunate that, you know, a lot of other financial firms offered to interview me a lot of, you know, the buy side shops. Um, But my mentor actually had a friend who had left Goldman Sachs for the tech industry. And she was like, Hey, she's like one of my best friends. Do you want to just talk to her? Turns out this woman ends up becoming my next manager at BuzzFeed. And where's this guy now? The guy who treated me badly? Yeah. He got promoted. (laughs) Sounds about right. Sounds about right. And you know, the craziest thing is, is like, I gave a really honest exit interview and I was like, Hey, like, this is what happened to me. I don't think he's fit to manage junior talent because you're going to see turnover. And they let him continue to manage junior talent. And you know what happened? Nobody stayed for longer than two years. Wow. And I think that sends a message that even though they knew that was the case, sometimes like they don't care. It's very interesting to me when uh, companies don't believe their employees. I think uh, I don't want to like play into a stereotype, but I do think they are likely less likely to believe women. Mm hmm. But it's unbelievable because people are giving you the information. It's all right there. And they just, it's wild. Okay. So things start looking up for you because you start making content and you talk about dating in New York as it relates to your finances. And um, this made me laugh so hard. So what experiences did you have dating that made you realize that like most people don't know anything about finance? Okay. So I went on the date with this guy and he was this was my first mistake going on dates with men exactly my age. No, I'm joking, but like, kind of not really, like kind of not really. Yeah. Kind of not really. Um, so this guy and I, he, we were the same age, same graduation year. He had a job at a competing bank. So I knew exactly how much money he was making because we were in the same exact role. Mm-hmm. And I was living in a square, 600 square foot studio with my roommate So like two of us, we would just like sit up and look at each other. Like there was no wall between our beds. Like it was basically a glorified NYU dorm room. It's amazing. And this guy, he was decked out to the nines. Like he had fancy Ferragamo loafers. He had like the Hermes tie. He had a Rolex. Like he was just like, he was so fancy. And I was like, Ooh, like he's like, like, you know, you're like, it's, it's appealing. You're like, what, like, what is this? How are you affording this? But like, also I'm kind of turned on and I was just like, so curious, but like, he had a nicer apartment than me. He had nicer stuff than me. And I was like, how's that even possible? Like, right. And I found out after a long night of drinking that he told me he had five figure credit card debt. And I almost puked in my mouth a little bit because sure. I didn't have a Rolex, but I did not have any credit card debt because Mm -hmm. I was living within my means. And it was crazy to me because he actually came from money generational wealth. His dad was a CEO and he was so bad with his money, like Mm -hmm. so unbelievably bad. And when he told me that I was like, Oh, are you like able to like return any of this? (laughs) (laughs) Can you return the loafers and the Hermes belt? Yeah. Yeah. Can you like return any of this? And like, it was just crazy to me that someone who very literally worked in high finance was working on billion dollar acquisitions was you know, in theory, well-versed in how financial markets and, you know, balance sheets and cash flow statements and income statements like works, like how they could not mentally piece together their own personal finances. Yeah. 
And it just made it really clear that like people who don't work in finance clearly don't know how finance works, but like people who work in finance also don't know how their own personal finances work either. You call them the Brads and the Chads, which which really made me laugh. Yeah. I mean, you know who I'm talking about. Like if you walk through Midtown in New York, it's the same guy. They all wear that white button down, their Patagonia vest. Like they have the same loafers. They're all carrying a banker bag and they're all just like, they just like think they're too cool for school. And yeah, you know, I think those people who seemingly should be good with their money aren't. Well, you say that historically financial services have been male, pale, and stale. And that things that these rich dads have been teaching their rich sons on the golf court is what their financial literacy is made up of. Um, But you say that someone uh, can really inform themselves about financial literacy. I think it's totally possible. We can learn anything. Uh, But you call your 3.5 million followers, me included, the leftovers, which is women, people of color, people in marginalized communities. And you're giving us a whole different kind of education. Yeah. Well, I mean, just like, think about it, right? If you close your eyes and you visualize the last person you saw on CNBC, what did they look like? It was a white guy in a button down, a white button down shirt and a tie. And if you are told every day, day in and day out, that that's what a rich person, a smart person, a financially stable, well-off person looks like, you're going to start believing that. And I think it's crazy that an entire swath of the population, literally 50% women have been completely left behind, not to mention people of color, not to mention the LGBTQ community. It's like, when are people going to start talking about our finances? When are people going to talk about whether or not it's an investment to buy a Birkin? When are people going to talk about, you know, what it costs to buy a home as a black home owner? Because unfortunately, redlining still happens today. It's super illegal and super unfair, but it definitely happens. And when are we going to start talking about surrogacy or adoption and what that costs to become a parent if you are in an LGBTQ relationship and you want to have a child in that way? And it's, it's you know, conversations that we never have because everybody assumes that you have to be a Brad or a Chad to be good with money. So one of the pain points I have with financial literacy is I think there's so much, for lack of a better term, inspiration porn out there. Like people tell you dream big, hustle, start a side hustle, but no one really tells you how to get there. And that's your expertise. So how do we get rich? Yeah. So I always say this is my proprietary method. If you want to be rich, you have to strip. And then people are like, oh, really? Um, But not like that. I mean, you know, if you want to be a spicy accountant, certainly, I think it is totally fine to do. Um, But I really recommend people S-T-R-I-P. So S stands for savings. Um, Three to six months of living expenses into a high yield savings account. It is so important that it's high yield. Regular savings accounts pay you nothing. You get a couple pennies at the end of the year for the pleasure of parking your money somewhere. When in reality, you should be getting interest because you are doing that bank a favor by loaning them that money and so that they can lend it out to other people. Um, T stands for total debt. I love doing this because I'm an Aries, so I'm very impatient. Um, Rank your debt from highest to lowest interest rate and pay it down in that order because it'll help you pay the least interest over time. We love saving money and it helps you pay off your debt in the fastest possible way because again, impatient. And what is considered debt? Student loans, credit cards? Student loans, credit card, your mortgage, your car note, anything, even that IOU you owe to your bestie, like anything where you owe, that is debt. Um, R stands for retirement. Um, it's really important for today us to take care of future us, um, especially knowing that so many of us work for other people. Um, you can get a 401k or 403b or 457 through your employer. And a lot of the time when you put money in to save for retirement, your, your employer will actually match that. So there are very few opportunities in life where you can get free money, but this is an opportunity to get that. So you put in a dollar, perhaps your employer matches 50 cents. So suddenly your dollar is worth a dollar 50. And if you're self-employed, what's your suggestion? Yeah. If you're self-employed, there are solo 401ks, there are self-employed IRAs. And again, IRA just stands for individual retirement account. And you can open one 
a, an, a regular IRA or a Roth IRA, depending on how much money you make every year. And again, these are just great ways to set money aside for future you. Awesome. So that's, and then we have I. Yes. So this acronym everybody really helps. helps. It's good, right? Yes. Um, so the I is people think that they open a 401k or they open a Roth IRA and they're like, I'm good. Like you're not good. You actually have to, I buy investments. Mm. And I think people get really excited because it's like, okay, like I'm going to pick the best stocks, the best companies. It's like, bro, when I was on wall street, that every single week we would get a phone call being like, well, this hedge fund blew up or this, you know, this shop is closing down because they made bad investment decisions. And you know, their investors want their money back. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, you do not have more resources than these people. They have thousands of dollars worth of technology that scans everything, the news, you know, the trading markets that like print and show what people are trading. They just have this endless amount of time and energy and technology at their fingertips. You're not going to be able to learn more on Yahoo Finance than they do off of their Bloomberg terminal. And I say this because even those guys can't get it right. Right. So I always recommend invest in ETFs and mutual funds that track broader indices, um, which is just a plural for index. So things like the S&P 500, the Dow Jones. Things that are grouped together. Correct. Things that are grouped together. Because instead of buying one stock, which is one company, you can buy a bunch and an ETF will likely hold tiny little fractions of a bunch of these companies. So if one company blows up or something bad happens, it's not going to tank your entire portfolio. I think there's a um, an idea specifically in America of like getting rich quickly. And mm -hmm. if you speak to wealthy people, most of them will tell you it's about uh, consistency over time. And so to your point, the ETFs and the mutual funds are all kind of about the long game, it seems. 100%. And, you know, listen, I totally agree. Right now, especially, everybody wants to get rich quick, but there's high risk and high reward. Yeah. Sure, maybe you could start the next meta and be Mark Zuckerberg and be a gazillionaire, but the odds of that happening are very, very low. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want to almost essentially guarantee millionaire status by the time you retire, you just need to invest yeah. for the most part. Anybody who is consistent and dedicated to that can retire a millionaire. And it's really time in the market that beats timing the market every single time. P. P. This is the one everybody forgets. Plan. You got to make a plan. You, you do not get to have your happily ever after. You don't get to ride off into the sunset if you don't know what that looks like for you. Yeah. For some people, their happily ever after is retiring at 30 and they live in an airstream and they don't have shoes and they, you know, traverse the Grand Canyon and that's their happily ever after. That's awesome if that's what it is for you. I like shoes though. And so I don't want to live in an airstream and I want to make sure that I am providing for my future kid. I want to be able to put them through school. I'd love to have a vacation home. And that's what my happily ever after looks like. It's really easy to just close your eyes, think about what would make you happy and visualize your happily ever after, and then make a plan to get there. Because if you don't know what it is, you can't hit it. And if you don't know how to create that plan, where can you look? Yeah, I would say even just starting with the strip method is so awesome, but yeah. resources that I love so, so much are Investopedia. Um, one of the scariest things about finance is the jargon. Like there's so many words, people just say them. And like, sometimes people who don't know what they mean also say them. Mm -hmm. And you're like, am I the only idiot who doesn't know what this means? It's literally Wikipedia for finance terms. Just check out Investopedia. I think it's really, really helpful. Yeah. I would also say start by talking to your friends about money. We've been told from a very young age, to your point from earlier, like it's a little awkward to talk about money. You can probably tell me the last three people your best friend has slept with, but you can't tell me how much your best friend makes. Don't totally. we think that's a little weird that we can talk about private parts, but we can't talk about pay? It, you know, you're making me think of something too. It's like, I've always felt like the shows we watch, the things we read, they all inform what we're thinking about. And so yeah. if we're just not thinking about money, we're not thinking about it. I know that sounds very basic, yeah. but you're right. Like instead of talking about Scandaval on Vanderpump Rules, yeah. talk about money a little bit. Popular culture and media though are starting to like almost turn because you'll see things like Scandaval and then you'll see articles that come out saying things like, you know, Ariana Maddox is making 
like off of the tales of this like horrible, tragic thing that happened in her life. Yeah. Certainly I would not wish being cheated on by your partner of almost like of a decade on anybody, yeah. but I will say being able to pen these incredible brand partnerships where she gets to make light of the situation, gets to cash what I'm considering probably multiple six, maybe seven figure checks. That definitely deafens the wound a little bit and it makes it a lot easier to stomach and, you know, more power to her. I hope she, you know, gets as much cash from this as possible. Like that's a horrible thing to happen, but we got to talk about the finances of it as well. I think you're right. And it's a great point. It's very cool that two years ago, those kind of articles probably wouldn't be coming out. Um, so it, everybody's saying we're headed into a recession now, um, but recession or not, I think a pain point for a lot of millennials is like, there is not that much extra income coming in. So if you don't have a ton of extra income to save for retirement, to put in a Roth IRA, how do you suggest people set themselves up for long-term success? Yeah. So I think a really scary stat that I recently read was that nearly I think it was like 50% of people who make over a hundred thousand dollars a year are currently living paycheck to paycheck. I just read that on LVS too. I, yes. I was actually going to ask you about it. I could yeah. not believe that because I would say, here's a couple things that we need to think about the people who are living paycheck to paycheck and making over a hundred thousand dollars. Odds are very good that they have those high paying jobs because they live in these major metros. And as you mentioned, the cost of living is just going up, 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 up. And there's two things that we can address as people who have control of our lives that are going to help us in these situations. And again, I recognize that like, if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you are more concerned about putting food on the table, like sometimes this information can feel a little tone deaf. I want that to be acknowledged. Yeah. But I do think that one thing we can all certainly recognize is that putting yourself in an uncomfortable position for a short term period of time could also potentially help you out financially for the long haul. So the two things being one cutting back, but not in the way that people talk about. Like, I think we hear headlines like millennials love avocado toast and lattes. It's like, okay, like that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you are shopping for groceries, making really thoughtful meal prep plans ahead of time. So you're not buying stuff that goes bad in your fridge. It's talking about, Hey, maybe pricing out what a Costco membership would look like so that you can Mm -hmm. save money buying a bulk. So you're saying like these little adjustments, maybe even getting a roommate. Exactly. These little adjustments and making sure that you are making the most of your money, because to your point, there are economies of scale and that's no better shown in than in New York city. It's very expensive for one person to get a one bedroom apartment, Yeah, but $10,000 $10,000 five bedroom apartment in, you know, wherever on the East side, like that actually works out to be a lot cheaper than yep. a one bed that might be shittier because guess what? Even with your four roommates, you only need one kitchen. So you don't have to pay for five kitchens. Mm-hmm. So it's just a really great way to like save money in that way. Um, I would also say one thing that we don't focus on nearly enough is you can only save and invest as much as you earn. You can always make more money. The easiest way to make a surplus is not by cutting and scrimping and saving. It's by literally just making more money. And I know that sounds so silly, but I need every single person listening right now to ask for a raise every damn year. Because if you're not asking for a raise, somebody else is, and somebody else is getting paid and you're not. And I don't mean that wimpy two to 3% inflation raise. I mean, you need to ask for 10%, 15% every single year. If your employer is not willing, what are your thoughts? I think you should ask every single year. Certainly you won't get 10 to 15% every single year. However, yeah. if you are at a company for your current role for two years, yeah, and you don't get promoted and you don't get paid, you need to leave. It's very much in my mentality called the upper out in two years, you need to be promoted and given a raise every two years or up or out up or out. You either go up or you have to leave every two years because there is a study that has shown that if you are at a company for two years or more, and you are not getting that raise, you are going to make significantly less over your lifetime. And I'm not about that. This is just my own experience, but tell me what you think. I also feel like when I've been in positions where I'm not being uh, paid 
what I think is at least fair. Mm -hmm. It money is um, a valuation. And so it actually shows up in a lot of different areas of respect amongst your workplace. Um, So the up and out is not just about making money. It's about like how you're being treated at work too. 100%. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us tie our self-worth to what we do for a living. Yeah. That's because you're an Aries and I'm a Capricorn. So we really do. Yeah. So we're like, (laughs) Um, it's um, our whole identity. Yeah. It's literally like my job is my entire personality. Yeah. But I will say that like, if your company shows you every single year with that raise that they're like, we cannot afford to lose you. We love you. You're going to go into work just more excited to do your job. Like, I can't remember what his name was, but the CEO of Gravity Payments basically cut his own salary down to $80,000 a year and paid everyone up Mm -hmm. even during a tough financial time. And you know what? His turnover rate was like nearly zero. Nobody left. Nobody quit on him. Even when things got bad, even when they had to work harder, even when they had to work longer hours, they were like, whoa, like this is truly what we have asked for day in and day out is for a manager who respects us to get paid our worth. And you know, when you have that type of loyalty and that type of respect, you're just going to have a better working environment. What are some of the mistakes you see millennials in particular making with money? Oh, I think the keeping up with the Joneses has gotten so insane these days. Um, back in our parents era, right. They would like take their little binoculars and they'd look across the hall or like look across the street and they would look at the Joneses and they'd be like, Oh, the Joneses have a new lawnmower. They have a new car. I see a box for a flat screen TV. Right. And you would compare yourself to that one other family or that one other person. Now the Joneses are actually keeping up with the Kardashians and you're on your phone and you look at every single one of your friends highlight reels. And then to make matters even worse, you're looking at Europe. Oh my God. Everybody I know is in Mykonos this weekend. Where, how are they all going there? How are they all at Scorpios at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy because you're watching your friends as highlight reels. So you're not even just comparing to one other friend. You're, see, you're, you think your friend is going on vacation every single week because a different friend is going on vacation every single week. Mm, and so it's her, this outsized feeling. Correct. Like you're just one person, but like you're comparing to this massive group of people. And to make matters worse, obviously they're comparing themselves to celebrities who have, you know, demonstrated wealth, like the Kardashians, like people who have money for private jets and private Island getaways. And it's not a fair comparison. It's not normal. The one thing I see getting better is I think, um, our age group was very into like it was Instagram, right? So it was like, we had to have a new outfit all the time. And Gen Z really is doing way better with that. But I realized something the other day because my dad broke his sunglasses and he was like, you know, I don't know where to get, I have to go get these fixed. And I thought to myself, if I break my sunglasses, I think, oh, I have to go get a new pair. (laughs) And that ideology between our generations stands for so much. Yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, even just like the divorce rate, right? Like we talk about like, oh, do you fix the old lamp and get a new light bulb or do you just buy a new lamp? Okay. I have some sort of, um, unorthodox questions about money. So I saw a TikTok video the other day. It was a parody video about, um, how much money it costs to be a hot girl. And she was kidding, but she started listing off all the things uh, that she pays for, which are haircuts, hair color, Botox, facials, nails, like all the things, right? And I was sitting there laughing, but I was thinking to myself, this is actually real. Mm -hmm. So one, what are your thoughts on this? And two, um, does that come into play when you show up for a date? I have a lot of friends who say, who talk <laughs> about like, it costs me X amount of money to show up for this dinner. So he should pay for this dinner. I don't necessarily agree, but I want to know your thoughts. Okay. Yes. So statistically speaking off of this data point, um, women will actually spend about a quarter of a million dollars. The average woman will spend a quarter of a million dollars on upkeep throughout her lifetime. And that is the tuition to go to Harvard. 
you can buy a house with that money. Vivian, say that again. The average woman spends about a quarter of a million dollars on upkeep in her lifetime. That's not to say like, oh, how do you put that money and invested it? It would be worth even more. That's just straight up the dollar amount. I know it's terrifying. You're right. It's the tuition for Harvard. It's a down payment on a house. It's on on a really nice house. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes from, again, back to that point of like keeping up with the Joneses. Like I think our generation and the generation after ours has done a better job of trying to be a little bit more realistic and being like, you know, I see some of these influencers now, um, you know, one that I love is Victoria Paris. And she's like, you guys think I'm so pretty Botox teeth are whitened. I got my lips done. I got a chin thing done. Like she points out like all the things that she had done. And she's like, I am not, I don't wake up and look like this. Like I spent thousands of dollars on this, like all of it's fake. And I think that's something the younger generation is so amazing about being honest. It's like, you're not ugly. You're just poor. (laughs) <laughs> like that's the joke. But we haven't changed the fundamental issue, which is beauty is currency for women and yes. finance yeah. is currency for men. Correct. 100%. Like it's no surprise. Prettier women get further in their careers. Men with more money have more dating opportunities. Okay. So I have a question though, because I think that there's an inflection point there specifically with women. If they're very pretty, it actually hinders them. If you're like too pretty or too hot, it's almost like people just assume that you're stupid. It's very expensive to be a modern woman. And so I totally understand where your friends are coming from, where they're like, I just spent $180 to even just show up for this date and like look presentable. Um, The guy should pay. I am very much of the camp that whoever invites should pay. If you invite me on a date, you should pick up the tab. If I invite you on a date, I'll pick up the tab because it's just courtesy. It's common courtesy. Like that person did not ask you, like you want to do this with them and they have obliged. So you should cover the check. I also still don't know where I stand on this, but I used to feel like, okay, is it transactional, right? Like if the man pays what's my, like, am I expected to kiss him? Am I like, what is, what is the expectation? And as I've gotten older, I think I've gotten over that a little bit, but I still feel, I kind of like paying my way to be honest. Yeah. I mean, when I was dating in my early twenties, if I was like not vibing, I would 100% pick up the check. Like I would go 50, 50 at least. And I would just be like, just get me out of here. Like I don't want to (laughs) ever again. Um, whereas like, if I like someone and they offer to pick up the check, I'd be like, Ooh, that's a plus. That's nice. You know? Yes. But I hear you. It very, it does in some ways feel very transactional. And as again, I think this just comes with like wisdom and age and like Mm -hmm. getting to the point of like, like giving less fucks. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, yeah, you can pick up the tab. It doesn't mean I have to go home with you. It doesn't mean like anything. And I tell that to all my girlfriends, um, when, you know, me and my fiance first started dating, he picked up, you know, uh, the first few meals, but when it became clear that we were going to be more serious and that we were going to be going out to dinner more together and spending more time together and doing things together, like I certainly offered to pick up the tab more frequently because I recognized that like he was only a year older than me. He, you know, we weren't making crazy money at the time and I didn't want him to be in a bad financial position just because he was dating me. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, there's like a teammate mentality there, yeah. too. but that's only after you decide you actually like, like that person and want to like mm-hmm. spend more time with them. <laughs> so you talk a lot on your Instagram about dating, um, financially unstable people. And you mm-hmm. said sex and money are two of the top reasons that people fight. So if you are dating somebody or say you go on a few dates and you're like, wow, I really like this guy and he's financially unstable, maybe even it's financially irresponsible What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think we have to define what it means to be financially unstable first. Okay. Because people always assume that just like, it's just me being like, you should only date rich people. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that it is okay to date someone with student debt, but do they have a plan to pay that student debt off? Mm -hmm. It's okay to date someone who is getting on their feet and isn't making that much money yet. Do they have aspirations to get to a point where their finances are in a good spot, where their income covers their expenses and then some, and they can set money aside? I think people often take it the wrong way because there's such a mentality of like, 
anybody who wants a financially stable partner is a gold digger. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I don't want someone to hold me back. If I can afford something and we decide we want to buy a home together, but your credit score is literally 600 or 500, like we are not going to get a good rate on this mortgage. I can't have someone holding me back. So I always say date someone who is financially stable, has a plan to improve their finances, is, you know, dedicated to being good with their money. Cause it's no longer cute to be like, it, like shopping spree. Like I'm bad with my money. It's not cute anymore. Like we have to be responsible in this way because it's getting harder. Do you consider it similar to like health goals, right? Like, yeah. um, it's sort of like, are you both aligned in terms of where you want your health to be, how you eat, how you work out, et cetera? I think it has to do with everything in the same way that like you would never seriously date someone who had a very different plan for their life. As I mentioned, you know, the Airstream versus the two homes, like those two people should not get married. The someone who wants to have seven kids and someone who wants no kids should not get married. So how do you think of having those conversations? Cause you're such a beautiful communicator. Um, how do you even broach that topic with somebody? Yeah. People ask me this all the time and I love it because I'm not saying go onto your first date and be like, bring a pay stub. Like that's crazy. <laughs> What's your credit score? <laughs> your credit score? Like you, that is going to scare all of your dates away. But I think it's important to ask questions about mm -hmm. and tangential to money. So if it's like, if you could take a vacation anywhere for seven days, what would you do? That tells you a lot about what someone values and what they want to do with their life and their money. You know, what is your dream job? That's going to tell you what someone would do if money was not a factor. Or I, I, I typically phrase it as like, oh, what job would you have? Like if money wasn't a factor. Mm -hmm. And it tells you a lot about what someone values and because it's their real, like on the inside. Yes. Yes. That's like, what would you really do? I tell people, I'm like, when I quote unquote retire, mm -hmm. I'd love to become a social worker when money does not matter. When I am not trying to save up money for a future kid, when I don't want to buy that second home, I've got the second home. Like I'm, I would love to be a social worker. It's such a thankless job, but it's so important. So I think it, it tells you a lot. Yeah. I moved in with a guy one time, like years ago, probably four or five years ago. And, uh, I had just quit my job. He made way more money than me. Like we are not on the same financial plane. And he was like, I got it. Don't worry. We'll figure it out. Once you move like to LA, I moved back from Chicago to LA. So I move into this apartment that I could have never afforded to this day. It's the nicest place I've ever lived. <laughs> and I like walked in, I was like, we can live here. Like what? So four months later, he dumps me, we break up. And I say this all to say during those four months, I felt the most uncomfortable I had ever felt in my life. I felt so indebted. I felt like I had to do all the dishes. I had to do all the laundry. And that's first of all, not fair. Like if anybody wants to read Fair Play by Eve Rodsky, you can really understand why that's not fair. But I said to myself, I will never move in with another man and not pay my portion of the rent. Like we need to move into a place that we can both afford or we're not, I'm not doing that ever again. What are your thoughts on splitting rent? I 100% agree. I will say in your situation where you had just left a job and it felt very much like a short term, like I will help you out while you find new employment. Like, I think that's okay. Like if yeah. you know you care about someone, that's okay. But um, what I really recommend for couples is not being equal, but really striving for equity in that if you have a partner who makes significantly more than the other, this person making significantly less should pay a portion of the rent that is proportionate to their income. Ooh, so thinking of it as a percentage. So think about it like this. Say you make $200,000 a year. And I make $100,000 a year Okay. and we move into an apartment that costs $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. I would hope that you would cover 2000. Well, I could cover $1,000 every single month just for, you know, easy numbers. Yep. Because that is a, the same proportion of your income as it is mine. I love this idea for everything. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fantastic. That way nobody feels indebted to the other, you know, and 
I, I've had this conversation myself with my fiance, because when we moved into our first apartment together, he was making a lot more money than I was. And I told him, I was like, I don't really feel comfortable moving into this apartment. Like, uh, like I'm not comfortable paying more than this amount in rent. And I don't want to like upset you, but like, I know you really like this place and I just don't see how I'm going to be able to swing this. And he was the one who brought up this setup. And he was like, well, since I make more money, like, why don't I just pay a little bit more rent? And it's fine. I love this idea. It's almost like if you think about it with roommates in your twenties, like if the person has the better parking spot and bigger room, they pay a little bit more. Yes, exactly. Vivian, that's so brilliant. I love this. Do you think in sort of like successful financial partnerships, do you see people doing it a certain way? Like, do they have their own bank accounts and then a shared account? What, what's a model that you like? Yeah. So again, personal finance is personal. I have heard everything and everything in between work. So there are some people who are like, Nope, we have one bank account. We put all our money in it. We draw from this bank account. It's just the two of us. Mm -hmm. There are couples that are like, we don't even have a single joint account. I have mine. They have theirs. Mm -hmm. My fiance and I do what I would say more couples do. I don't, I don't want to say most, but we have a yours, mine, and our system. So he has money. I have money. And we have joint accounts for paying for things like our mortgage, for our groceries, for stuff that we do together, for date nights, stuff like that. And that works really nicely for us because I am very much of the camp that every woman should have her own money. Mm-hmm. And I like having mine. And I, love to be able to go get my eyelashes done and go buy myself a nice lunch and not feel bad about it because it's my money. Right. And I also love that he has his own money so that if he wants to go golfing or, you know, get a haircut or have drinks with the boys, like it's fine. It's his money. Have fun. How does it work once you have kids? If that's something you're wanting, it would just be, it would be the same setup. However, um, all of our kids' expenses would come out of the joint account. So we would just have to put more money into that account. And maybe that does mean both of us have to scale back on our personal spending. But, Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully if we have a kid, that little bundle of joy will just, you know, be a priority for us. That's really cool. So you mentioned earlier in our conversation, uh, Birkin bags, and I think that it's, um, like it's, it's something the, the way I feel about pop culture is like, I'm not really obsessed with what Kim Kardashian is wearing or saying. I'm obsessed with like the socio-political issues that we can draw from the Kardashians. Yeah. And I feel that way with luxury items and finance because I know you're a stats person. So the average woman has 13 purses and she buys three a year. So uh, one in 10 women is so very high. Three a year is a lot. That's a lot. So they say one in 10 women spend more than $1,000 on their purses in the year. Um, but the average price is $160. Okay. So we constantly hear about like on Instagram, not constantly here in life, but on Instagram, we hear about women, quote unquote, investing in Birkins. Mm -hmm. I personally have always lived by the idea that like money looks better in your bank account than on your feet or on your wrist. Um, But that's not to say that's the right way. What are your thoughts uh, with women buying luxury items? Because it is very disproportionate to men buying luxury items in America. It's not. That's the lie that we've been fed that you're kidding. Us girly girls love to splend. We love to splurge. We love to buy luxury items. Think about the dumb shit men buy. They love me. Like they love buying fancy watches. They will buy these fancy belts, these fancy shoes, these, and you know, you don't think that they cost a lot, but like when we buy a bag and I'm talking a luxury bag, you're looking at something and not a Birkin, but like a luxury bag, you're looking at something between two to $5,000. Yep. The entry level Rolex is like six to 8,000. Right. Or like a golf course, like a membership to a golf course for the year. A membership to the golf course is literally probably two or three times what a Soho house membership is. And on top of that, you have to pay every single time you play. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to tip the caddy. You have to do all of these things and it's very expensive. And then, you know, uh, we catch flack for wanting a new outfit, but it's like every single time the new iPhone comes out, who's mm-hmm. at the front of the line, literally jonesing to get the new phone, who wants the new watch, the Apple watch, who wants to get the, you know, the new headphones, like they spend just as much as we do, but we just get more shit for it. Yeah. That's so, so funny. I, what I will say is, is like, I think 
investing in luxury, like truly investing is something that you should really wait until you are frankly, like quite wealthy buying, um, luxury is something that you can do at Mm -hmm. any stage in your life, as long as you budget for it. And I think it's okay to treat yourself. I certainly did when I was young, like in my early twenties, like the first thing that I bought with like my big girl, part of my big girl bonus was a black Prada bag because Mm -hmm. I was like, I deserve this. It was like blood, sweat, tears, money. And I will say that like, if you really want to invest, it's still better to invest in a diversified portfolio of index funds than it is to buy and bet on one bag or one watch or one anything just Mm -hmm. because you don't know where the pricing for that is going. There's a good example, like that Cartier love lock bracelet that Mm -hmm. people have. Those went down in value significantly and people never thought that would happen. So not worth the weight in gold, literally. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I have some rapid fires for you. Let's do it. The weirdest job you've ever done for money. Weirdest job. Oh my God. Uh, my freshman summer, um, when I was literally 19, um, mm-hmm. I was like a club promoter. You're kidding. <laughs> I literally was the person standing next to the bouncer, like putting wristbands on people. That's amazing. I would yeah. have never expected that from you. <laughs> That's awesome. That actually says so much about your hustle. I love it. I have a very in-depth story about this um, in my book that's coming out later this year because this was such a formative job. It was like my first real job in college and it was like the most insane one. When does the book come out? Uh, The book officially releases uh, December 26th of this year. Um, Mm -hmm. So basically after you have all of your holidays, you can do a financial detox with me, get your money right, you know, very much new year, new me. That's great. But it's available for pre-order now. So it's titled Rich AF by Vivian Tu, aka Your Rich BFF. Um, and it's basically the winning money mindset that'll change your life. I love that. Okay. On Instagram and TikTok, you do a series that I love that's called overhyped overpriced. Mm -hmm. What is the most worth it product that you've bought? Good bedding. Good bedding. Good bedding. Like sheets and a comforter and stuff. Yes. What do you, you, what did you buy that you loved? So I am crazy. I use a thousand thread count sheets and silk pillowcases and the way I see it, you spend a third of your life asleep and ostensibly you're in your bed and Mm -hmm. you can cheap out on the bed frame. You can cheap out on, you know, the, the nightstand don't cheap out on the mattress. Don't Mm -hmm. cheap out on the bedding. Don't cheap out on the pillows because that is going to impact your sleep and your sleep impacts everything about your life. What to do if you get told that there's no room for negotiation when you go in to negotiate, I would ask, um, you know, is there anything that I would be able to do in the future to make your end, because you're probably talking to your manager, your Mm -hmm. end of this negotiation easier. And if it's, if there's no room in the budget right now, do you know when there will be? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Cause you're going to get the, like you said, the inside answer, the real answer of if they have any plan for you. Yeah. Um, Okay. I know you love to travel. What is something that you have done to make traveling easier for you? Oh, I bring uh, eye bag jellies like for your under eyes uh, on planes. Cause I find that when I travel, I always have the air vent on. Otherwise I get too hot, but mm-hmm. it really dries out your skin. And then it makes you more prone to sun- like sunburn. It's just like, it's like horrible. So I always bring jellies or a face mask and it can turn any economy experience into a first class flight. That's fantastic. What's a book you read that changed your life? Something you think everybody should read. Can I give you an old one and a new one? Of course. Okay. So I really do love, richest man in Babylon, because it basically teaches financial concepts in like a very silly way of pertaining to ancient Babylon, talking about, you know, buying donkeys instead of dumb stuff and how negotiations work at like the bazaar instead of like, you know, what you would think about now. Um, but recently a book that I am very, very into, and I'm only like a chapter or so in is the shift by tanks. Um, she basically talks about how you should shift your mindset and perception and how you handle situations in your life versus feeling like you need to fit into a mold of what everybody else is doing or like how others perceive you. And I think it would have been a really helpful book for me to have read in my teens or in my early twenties, because it's just so positive in terms of like building up your own self-worth and self-confidence. It's nice. Okay, so I do a pretty smart question. Tell me when to stop. 
Now, everybody always gets the one they're supposed to. It's wild. Okay. What is your earliest memory or example of success and how did it impact you? Oh, wow. In the fifth grade, um, we were doing a poetry like session or segment, I guess, in our English classes. Mm -hmm. And we all wrote poems and then the class would vote on the two best ones. And then those would be submitted to potentially be published. But my poem was published in the fifth grade. And that's not even the cool part. The cool part was the local newspaper came to our school to take a photo of me and my fifth grade teacher. And I think my mom still has like the newspaper clipping to this day. I just remember her feeling like so proud. She like put it on our fridge. Um, and I saw the way that it made like her feel. And to me, it was just like, oh, like I love being right. I love getting an A on an assignment. I was like such a little goody two shoes. Um, but you know, I love that feeling of like pride for her, but also pride in myself. That's a really great story. Yeah. Thanks. What is the smartest decision you've ever made? Curveball, I would say choosing the right partner. Mm. So when I was dating, there were tons of like really awesome guys. Like I was lucky. Like I had dated some really nice guys that I was like, you are going to make someone very, very happy one day, but they didn't necessarily challenge me in that way. Mm -hmm. I wanted someone who wasn't just going to agree with everything I said, who was going to push back, who was going to be like a partner and like really be my equal and think deeply about me and our life. Um, and I'm so lucky. My fiance does that. Um, he's kind, he's caring, he's generous. He's all these great things, but even more importantly, he's the first person to call me out on my bullshit. And I think having someone in your life that supports you or knows you even better than you know yourself is so, so important because if you have a partner who needs to dim your shine to feel good about themselves, you're never going to get anywhere with that extra baggage. You want someone who's going to be your number one cheerleader and who pounds the table for you to get what you deserve. Do you feel like he sees you the way you see you? He sees me the way I want to be seen. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 